We're now going to talk about the information systems infrastructure, and there's a lot of it. Um, and some information systems classes, you could have this as an entire semester. Um, that's crazy. We are just going to do one module on it, and we're going to hit the highlights and the most important pieces. We're not going to dig into the details. Uh, we just don't need to. You need to understand some important pieces. So I think one of the important pieces was the, what was it called? The Intergalactic Computer Network, seriously, uh, a guy responsible for ARPANET back in the 60s said we needed an intergalactic computer network. And his notion, which led to the development of the internet, was that we needed a network that would protect America. Now, cast your minds back to 1960. All right, now you've done that, you've got nothing. Uh, what was going on back in 1960? are in the 1960s. And if you think about it, a little bit of history, what you know is this was the height of the Cold War. Russia versus America, nuclear weapon proliferation, and there was something called mutually assured destruction where everyone gets destroyed by nuclear weapons. And what the uh, people in the United States realized is what we need is a way to make sure our command and control, our communications networks are up and running even if something goes wrong. Because the first thing we always do, if you cast your mind back to the first Iraqi war, uh, the first thing America did was take out the Iraqis' command and control st uh, structure, and you always do that first. So the Americans, with the Advanced Research Programs Agency, ARPA, which is now D DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Program Agency, uh, started a project wherein uh, they would design a network, and I get this next word, which would route around problems. And as you can imagine, given that word, one of the big things they decided to develop was something called a router. And in this section of class, I have a piece on what a router is and how it works. And then another thing to get a, an inter, what is it, a globally, or an intergalactic computer network, another thing you need to be able to do to do that is you need to break information into tiny little packets. And so it's called a packet switching network. And really all that is, is um, imagine a rail car. And your rail car is getting loaded with, let's do coal, since we're in Montana. We're loading a rail uh, cars with coal. And before 1960s, the way things work is you needed a mile long, just one mile long coal car um, and you filled the whole damn thing with coal. And then in the 1960s, when they decided to develop the Advanced Research Program uh, Network, ARPANET, which was changed to the internet once it was developed, um, what they decided is you needed to have small rail cars, and each one got filled with a little piece of coal. And so really, this, this is nothing different, by the way, from how communications worked back in AD0. Um, and so what I like to say about a lot of what goes in the world is there's nothing new. It's just a technologically uh, enabled version of what used to happen. So back in Roman times, imagine uh, Kalili, well, let's think about it. General Maximus was in battle, and he was getting surrounded, and he decided he needed to send a message to Caesar Augustus. And the long-range communication of the time was carrier pigeon. And imagine you grab a carrier pigeon and you write a note. So you've got uh, General Maximus writes, Dear Caesar Augustus, um, having a great time here having this war, but we're getting surrounded. And then the piece of paper that the carrier pigeon can carry is now full. And so he writes one of, and he's going to write three pages, he figures out. So he writes one of three. And then on the next sheet of paper, he writes two of three. And where were we up to? We're getting surrounded. Um, um, page two, he writes, please send reinforcements quickly. And now that page is full. And so he takes page three and writes three of three. And he says, oh, my love, General Maximus. Uh, and that's page three of three. Now he ties those two individual carrier pigeons, one, two, and three, and he throws them up in the air. And when they arrive in Rome, um, Caesar Augustus, he doesn't get the carrier pigeons necessarily in the order they were sent out. And so he reads the second message, 
sees that it's two of three, waits for one of three to come in, and he puts the message to us together in the order. And that's exactly how packet switching networks work. They break a message up into carrier pigeon sized size lengths. Uh, they label them one of three, two of three, three of three. Actually, on each one, they say Tur Caesar Augustus. So each carrier pigeon sized piece of paper would have been labeled to Caesar Augustus. And that's exactly what a packet switching network does. Each carriage, each piece, uh, says where the message is going. And then that gets thrown out on the network. And these routers, what they do is they look at the top of the pe each piece of uh, packet. And each packet says to Caesar Augustus. And the router knows where Caesar Augustus um, knows where Rome is. And it sends the message on the most efficient route down to Rome. And that's exactly how packet switching works to this day. So when did the first computers come around in business? Well, which country? Well. Any good answer to any question in this class is always going to be England. So the first computer started in England, and it was the Lyons Electronic Office. That was back in 1953. And what it did was it cut the payroll processing time for Lyons, which was a global tea company. They um, gathered tea from around the world and turned it into tea for everyone to drink. Um, it was one of the largest companies in the world and it reduced their payroll processing from three weeks to about eight minutes. And you can imagine the operational efficiencies from that. Now here's another piece of history that I find interesting. It's not important, but I find it interesting, is why that first Lions Electronic Office, as it was called, was called a computer. Well, here's why. Before 1953, the people who did payroll processing were people and actually they were women and the women part was because this was right after World War II. All the men had gone off to war and all the women had gone into the workforce. And so you had these very smart women who were in rooms calculating these things. And these women were called computers because they computed things for the companies. And so you had rooms full of computers except they were women doing the computing. And so, and this happens so many times just in life is that whatever the new piece of technology that replaces the old gets called what the old thing was. So these new Lions Electronic Office got called a computer because it replaced human female computers. I don't know if you know, but the first cars that came out were called horseless carriages. Why? Because they replaced the horse and carriage, only they didn't have a horse, so they were called horseless carriages. Very common in business and in life that things happen that way. So we have the internet. That was developed in the 60s by the US Defense Advanced Research Program Agency. That is the road, the networks on which things drive. But you need to have traffic on the roads to make it useful. And so the World Wide Web is some traffic that runs on those roads and it has a particular protocol particular way of talking. So for instance, in this class, we are speaking, well, I'm speaking um, um, English English. You probably speak American English, but it's a protocol in which we can talk to each other. Io parlo italiano. That was me speaking a little bit of Italian, and we don't use that in class because that's not the protocol we have to discuss things. But there's a protocol on the internet, TCP, IP and that allows for information to travel over the internet and protocols are incredibly important in business. You need a protocol to make things happen globally. Anyway, it was an Oxford physicist, Tim Berners-Lee, who came up with the World Wide Web in 1989 and his idea was to be able to communicate using hyperlinks. And even that wasn't a brand new idea. His notion was built off those books. Do you remember growing up reading a book where in chapter one you've got Johnny and Sarah and they go out adventuring and they go into a room and in the room there are two doors, a red door and a green door. And then the book said, if you choose the red door, go to chapter two. And if you choose the green door, go to chapter three. That was called hypertext. 
And would you believe Tim Berners-Lee, all he did was take hypertext and came up with a hypertext markup language which allowed web pages to jump around using hypertext. Exactly like those books you read as a kid. Nothing new in the world, guys. It's just the technological enablement of something that's already been thought about and done well. And that's what Tim Berners-Lee, Oxford physicist, in 1989, he came up with the World Wide Web. So this chapter, uh, this module in our course, is all about uh, the infrastructure, the information systems infrastructure. We've got protocols, we've got domain name servers, we've got um, routers, we've got pieces that make the internet work. At the bottom of this, I've also put a couple of videos up. One is about Facebook's uh, data center infrastructure, and one's about Google's data center infrastructure. What I love about these two videos is here you have two of the best known, best run companies in the world, and they do some things for their data centers the same, but they do some things really differently. And I find it interesting that here we are, you know, almost at 2020, and You've got two global, really well capitalized, enormously successful companies running their data centers kind of the same and a lot different at the same time. So those two videos are really useful, pretty short, really kind of get you inside a data center and show you how things work, which I think is going to be very useful indeed.